uh, I guess while we're still getting settled, uh, I, I guess to uh, sort of duplicate what I said yesterday for those who didn't come to yesterday's talk. Uh, uh, today's lecture uh, is actually uh, uh, three events uh, in a series of talks uh, or events uh, relating to Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And the main event is tomorrow, the workshop, uh, in which uh, there will be six presenters uh, for four international scholars and two uh, faculty members from, from our institute. And as I said yesterday, well, why do we need another conference on Belt and Road? I mean, those of us who've been to this kind of conference knows that it's, it's a hot topic everywhere. There's loads of people presenting papers. And, and I said, well, of course, we, we, we don't do a political policy here, so that's even stranger. I mean, one could say, well, why, why should cultural studies people be interested in this stuff? So, well, uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, going to many of these conferences is that surprisingly, uh, a lot of these experts are not experts on, on Belt and Road. They may be experts on other things. I think a very small proportion of them are actually seriously looked at Belt and Road for what it is. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, uh, also being in Taiwan, I, I think uh, as we're talking today, I have this general perception that well, it's, it's kind of surprising that people in Taiwan are not really sensitive to what this is. I mean, it's, uh, it certainly has world, worldwide ramifications, and there are many reasons for this. So those are some of the under, underlying features, in addition to the fact that we are all looking at Belt and Road from very different perspectives. So we are not experts on Belt and Road, but there's, there's something here that's, that, that, that piques our interest, our serious interest in something else. So um, given all of these interests, I think, you know, it's, it's, we're not here to listen to more case studies of Belt and Road. No, uh, we, we're here to, to, to talk about what, what is it? And, and what are the ramifications? Uh, what, one of the conferences that I went to on so-called Belt and Road and Silk Road was, well, okay, half the people talked about Europe, half the people about Southeast Asia. I said, well, why are people talking about Africa? I mean, we don't call it Belt and Road necessarily, but you can see certain the same kinds of phenomena going on there. So the issues uh, go beyond literal policies and literal politics. I mean. Well, what are the commonalities underlying all of these things, if, if we're talking about the China chapter? And, and what are the differences? Everyone who's worked in, certainly Africa, will tell you that every country is different. Uh, one of our participants uh, who couldn't come this time uh, to our data by, I keep saying that Central Asia is not a place. It's, it's a, every country is different. So we should be looking at both similarities and, and, and differences in, in order to sort of uh, try to put together what this is all about. So uh, it, it's more a discussion that we need, and, and, and I'm glad that we, we, we did invite you know uh, uh, the right people to this uh, because they represent the, the right uh, fields of expertise that, that we do not know, and certainly we have to start there. So yesterday, um, uh, Professor Li Xing gave us a, a, a very interesting uh, talk, and uh, based on his own experience, uh, in, in uh, the Chinese global economy and, and related issues. And, and today, uh, Professor Ian Taylor from the uh, School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews uh, is a well-known uh, specialist in Africa. Um, and uh, uh, having dealt with many countries and, and his recent book there, I, I, I suggested that he simply talk about his most recent book, which is not very recent for you. It's very old by now, but, uh, but, but certainly it is, uh, for, for those of us who haven't uh, looked at it, I mean, it's, it's certainly a good starting point. Uh, and, and we have, in our institute, uh, uh, many faculty members, one who just came back from Uganda, and, and, and students working uh, from Africa, and, and also other people working on Africa. So Africa sh it is, is a field that we should uh, know more about, so it's very, we're very fortunate to have you here uh, to talk to us. Uh, so with, with that, um, maybe we should welcome you. Uh, congratulations on surviving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Alan. Well, thanks for the invitation to Taiwan. I've never been here before, so uh, so far I've seen the, 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 uh, the road from the airport to the university, which looks very nice, very green, very clean. Very nice. 
<laughs> so hopefully I'll, I'll see some more of Taiwan. So um, what I want to do um, today is just to talk about, try to try and draw out the main themes from a, this book I wrote, which uh, I can't remember what it was now, two or three years ago, um, and it's called Africa Rising? Question mark, and then it talks about the BRICS. And the, the book was originally written because I wanted to try and understand this phenomena, which seemed to be um, dominant at the time, which is this idea that Africa was rising and that things had really changed in the continent. And that, uh, good, according to the proponents of Africa rising, good governance and co the correct policies, as, it, as they would call them, basically neoliberal policies, um, had come together to try to, to promote um, an Africa which was different from the past, an Africa which was on the upward trajectory, an Africa which was developing. And I wasn't very convinced by a lot of the statistics and data that people were providing about this Africa rising. I don't know whether it reached here, but there was a lot of talk at the time about a, a large African middle, African middle class which is going to propel Africa in the future. Um, but then there was disappointment when it, when it was discovered that the, the, the basis of, the, of the, um, the middle class was essentially anyone who had more than three dollars a day to spend, um, which in some countries might be classified as middle class, I guess, but in global terms certainly wouldn't not qualify as a member of the bourgeoisie. So um, there were other things as well which seemed to be quite tentative in terms of the long-term trajectory of Africa and whether or not the continent was rising. So that's basically what I tried to try to look into, and uh, I'll just try and explain what, what I, I found out and what, what I um, discussed. So first of all, the point is that to really encourage the, the proponent of Africa rising was from about 2000 onwards, we see the GDP rose quite sharply, GDP growth per year rose quite sharply, although there's a dip, of course, um, a little bit later, but it remained quite strong for a period of time, okay? Um, and certainly it's much higher than it was, say, in the early 1990s. And so this idea of an Africa rising kind of captured the imagination. But one of the things which I thought was quite interesting was that the basis of this argument, Africa was rising, was really a celebration of the fact that Africa had recovered its growth figures which I had previously had in about 1981. When we think about 1981, we don't think of a continent which is on the rise. 1980 is usually bit of as a lost decade. And I think what really kind of encouraged people to talk about an, an, an Africa rising was the fact that certainly by the end of the, of the 1990s, sort of 1980s, and at the end of the Cold War, when there was basically a lot of people, not a lot of the um, external actors, lost interest in the continent, investment dropped, and GDP growth dropped as well. So we saw this growth, and the growth that lasted from about 2000 to about 2015. This was the period when we had these figures, like the Economist, for example, would, high, would highlight the fastest growing country between 2001, 2010, 2011, 2015. And you see a lot, there's a large number of African countries uh, who are enjoying GDP growth. And they also showed that somehow GDP growth in terms of a comparison of Asia and Africa, Africa had overtaken Asia. And there was a lot of excitement at the time about this, and a lot of celebration in sort of the media. So it led to this, basically, which was this proliferation of good news stories about how the continent was, was fundamentally different. Okay. Next Africa, bright continent, emerging Africa, etc. Lots of different books, lots of different reports. I have to say a lot of the reports were, bit, were, were from uh, investment banks and financial houses trying to sell, basically, an Africa as a place where people could uh, invest in. And of course, that's for their own benefit. But there was a lot, lot of this noise at the time um, about this new Africa. And you might remember back in 2000, The, the Economist wrote had a very infamous cover page where they basically wrote off the whole continent as the lost continent, right? So, so a, a billion people, according to the economists, were suddenly hopeless. And then 
you know, if they switch to 2011, 2012, they're now talking about Africa rising. Uh, so, Time magazine as well. So this was kind of an interesting sort of period in Africa history, actually, and, and for people watching Africa and studying Africa, this was quite um, perplexing, actually, because yes, there was GDP growth was in, was improving. But GDP growth is not something which you really measure in terms of the health of an health of an economy, and it certainly doesn't tell us anything about the structural conditions within African economies. It doesn't tell us whether anything is really changing in Africa, and surely that would be the basis of a real rise in Africa. And GDP growth per se uh, can be, of course, very misleading and can be quite distorted, as we all know. But it was precisely GDP growth that a lot of the people kind of seized on, the economists and others, to argue that there was something new was happening on the continent. Now, it's true to say, I would say that GDP growth increased. That's, that's not uh, disputed, it's disputable. But actually, I think the real factors behind this was the involvement of the BRICS countries. And when I say the BRICS, I have to be honest, I'm really talking about China. China makes up 76% of the BRICS total uh, GDP. Uh, India, of course, is next, and Brazil and South Africa, uh, Russia, quite a bit down. So it was really a demand from China and India, and specifically China during this period, that drove up uh, prices. So during this period, immediately, immediately, of course, after the financial crisis and the stimulus package in China, the Chinese government put in billions of dollars to uh, local, gave, gave to local governments, to invest in infrastructure and transport, etc., to try to stave off and prevent the uh, global crisis hitting China. The manufacturing sectors, particularly in China but also in India, started to develop and they started to, to, to demand raw materials. Food in, uh, consumption in the BRICS countries also increased. And you can see that there's a correlation between the African GDP increase and the commodity price index. So, which is, tracks quite, quite strongly. So this in itself, that graph in itself, tells you something. And that, what it tells you is, is that the GDP growth in Africa was not internally driven. It was externally driven by external demand. Okay? And domestically, that doesn't tell us anything. It tells us more, actually, about how dependent Africa is on external trade. And of course, as we all know, the reason for this is colonization and imperialism, which inserted Africa into the global system, the global capitalist system, in an unequal fashion, and a way in which basically the vast majority of African countries, 80 to 90 percent of their exports are primary commodities, which are then, of course, processed in, in the West or in China nowadays, of course. So we have the kind of classic core periphery relationship which dependency theory would talk about and other critical political economists would talk about, Africa still has not really escaped from this phase. Um, and that's something which is extremely important whenever we discuss, and as you all know, uh, when we discuss Africa's international relations and its relationship with countries such as the BRICS. So numerous asset managers, investment funds, all sorts of stuff, business press were very um, Enthusiastic, and this is just a slide from McKinsey, which I thought was quite interesting, because I don't know if you can see, but so it talks about, so it's basically trying to portray that Africa's this big opportunity for investment funds and uh, capitalist corporations. So it talks about how you've got 1.2 billion people, which of course in their mind means you've got 1.2 billion markets. It's very similar to what people talk about China in the 1980s, right? A huge market. But there's some interesting things um, which I thought they don't really talk about. Uh, what, what they talk about, but they don't actually mention the real issues. So they, they'll talk about, say, 11 million square miles of land. But that's not 11 million square miles of usable land, or agricultural land. That, doesn't, that includes the Sahara, it includes the jungles of the Congo, it includes areas which in East Africa which can't be cultivated, etc. And there's various things here which first glance look quite attractive, but unless the structural structural um, situation in a specific African country uh, is uh, favourable, then 
doesn't really tell us too much. So what, what happened during Africa Rising is during this period from about 2000 to 2015. Well, one thing which is quite helpful to look at is something called the African Transformation Report. And what it did was it compared some of the countries which had emerged from what we previously called the periphery into the semi-periphery, perhaps, um, such as Brazil, Chile, um, you can see the countries up there. They didn't, they didn't, didn't include Taiwan, but they, they did include Singapore and South Korea. So, so some of the Asian tigers, but plus some other countries from, from elsewhere. And then it contrasted or, or analyzed the, the uh, early transformers with 15 selected African countries, which together make up about 70% of Sub-Saharan Africa's population, three quarters of its GDP, 85% uh, of its manufacturing sector, or where the value added is, is etc. So these 15 countries are, they're not representative of the whole of Africa, of course, and as Alan says, um, you know, we always have to remember that we're talking about Africa, as if it's, you know, mm. we always have to remember that they have big divergences. But uh, the 15 countries are kind of representative of some of the stronger economies uh, and some of the countries which uh, were certainly experienced high, high GDP growth uh, during this period of so-called Africa rising. So let's very quickly look at what, if we compare the kind of Asian tigers and some of the early transformers who have moved along the path of industrialization and diversification with some of these uh, ACT, ACET 15 countries. So first of all, let's look at manufacturing. And what we see is, in contra contrast from 1970 onwards to the way in which the early transformers built and developed a uh, manufacturing sector, right, which is part, of, part and parcel of the whole Africa rising, uh, sorry, Asia rising story, I guess you could say, Asian tiger story. But look what, what happened to Africa. It's basically remained flat in terms of its manufacturing sector since the 1970s. And certainly if you go look at 2000, it's, it, didn't, it declined. Okay? So this, of course, is one of the historical challenges of Africa, is to build up an industrial base, to diversify its um, uh, industries, to diversify its economies. And part and parcel of this is manufacturing. And you can see that, according to the ACT-15, certainly during the period of Africa rising, but quite going back historically, Africa has not developed a robust manufacturing sector in contrast to the early transformers. When we look at the diversification in terms of the top five exports, right, we do see a slight improvement for Africa. Okay, slight improvement, but Africa still, as a continent, the continent is still, as, as I mentioned, about 80 to 90 percent of the continent's exports are primary commodities, which of course are very vulnerable to external price shocks, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll explain what happened in China as to why the Africa rising story kind of came to an end. In terms of manufacturing in Africa's exports, we've seen an improvement certainly since the mid-80s, but then a stagnation. And during the period of 2000 Africa rising, no real fundamental change. So in contrast to the early transformers, where we saw this radical change in the structure of the export, exports, which are uh, uh, sent out to the world, Africa enjoyed, did enjoy a period of an uptick, but that was in the 1980s. And certainly since the 1990s and 2000s, we've seen this rather flat line. Okay? And finally, I think this is the last slide in this series, there has been a decline in the non-extractive sectors. In other words, those sectors which are not based on purely extraction, such as mining, oil, you know, type of things, diamonds, etc., um, coal, there's actually been a decline uh, in, the, in, in, in that in Africa, certainly since the 80s, the 1990s. So, what we have is continued structural disarticulation, you might call it, in the majority of African economies, where they are importing much more than they're exporting, and what they are exporting is primary commodities which are dependent upon external demand, and which are very vulnerable to changes in consumption patterns, in 
destination countries, either personal consumption patterns or consumption patterns of economies as a whole, such as China, which, because of its new policies, which were announced a few years ago, they basically don't need as much African products as they did in the past. And so dependence on exports of these products without diversifying your economy leads you to a very vulnerable situation. And that's kind of brought the story of Africa rising to, to a halt in many respects. So what kind of happened? Well, first of all, as I mentioned already, there was a very strong link, first of all, between GDP growth and commodity prices. But there's actually quite a strong link between Africa's GDP um, and China's GDP growth. Okay? So this is, first of all, is, is, is China's GDP um, linked to commodity prices, global commodity prices. So here you can see there's a correlation between the strength of the Chinese economy and demand for commodities, which then pushed up commodity prices. And this is very much part of the Africa rising story uh, in terms of where the GDP growth was being um, pushed from or, or delivered from. What we actually saw during the period from 2000 to 2011, so kind of the majority of Africa rising period, but not all of it, you actually see a decrease in manufactured products being exported to the BRIC countries specifically, right? And an increase in commodities. China is particularly uh, a good example of this, so is India. Okay, you see South Africa is more diversified, uh, Brazil to a certain extent. But look at China and India, you see basically the blue line is, the blue color is fuels, so oil essentially. You see China and India, it's basically the vast majority, uh, it's just oil going to, going to India and going to China. And then manufactured goods, which is the orange sector, you can see it's, it's in the China thing, shrunk by about half. And in the India thing, it, it decreased by about 75, by 25 percent, I should say. Okay? So if you think about China and India as the main BRICS actors, then you can see that the export profile of African, sub-Saharan African exports to the, these two important BRICS countries became very much dominated by oil and the, the sector where the value is added, which of course is, is the industrial production, manufacturing, for example, uh, quite negligible in some respects. Now, commodity prices were very strongly driven by, as I mentioned, the Chinese economy. And this is not surprising because it just is just a graph to show that um, Chinese consumption during this period, um, say towards, this, this is in 2011, so it's towards the end of the Africa rising period, Ch Chinese consumption of these basic commodities was taken up between 60 and 40 percent of some of the major commodities which Africa exports, things like coal, copper, uh, zinc, etc. So that leads you to the situation where it becomes very problematic if China changes its policies and reduces any, if there's any depression of its demand for commodities for all exporting countries, uh, commodity exporting countries, not only Africa, I mean, we think about Australia, right? Look what's happened to the Australian economy. Uh, they became very dependent upon the Chinese market and that they're, they're now having problems. So Africa is definitely not unique in this situation at all. It's just typical uh, of, of the kind of structures of global trade. Uh, Africa is perhaps in a worse position simply because of the effects of colonization and imperialism, which of course, as I mentioned already, um, just inserted these, these economies into the, into the global system as reservoirs for extraction. Extraction, first of all, of people, the slave trade, and then, of course, later on, when the, the Europeans set up their empires, it was extraction based on uh, fuel, food, every, you, know, you know the story of what the, what the Europeans did to Africa. So, Africa, growth very much dependent upon commodities. You can see this commodity price index. Uh, GDP growth, which we've shown that a few times now, you can see that it, it, it jumps up and down. But just imagine, just imagine you're a minister in an African government planning ahead for five years to promote some sort of development plan, right, on projected income for your country over the next, say, five or ten years. You can't do it because it's just doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. It's such a volatile 
a situation. Commodity prices can be and very often are so very vol very volatile. And if 80 or 90 percent of your economy is dependent upon this, you've got a problem. And you cannot plan ahead at all. So there was actually, as, as I showed, so there's actually a correlation between Chinese growth and African growth. So this is a comparison of the Chinese GDP growth. You see it goes up, and then it goes down. You see Sub-Saharan Africa, it goes up, and then it goes down. And it actually tracks, to an interesting degree, actually, um, China's economy. So during this period, actually, you have not directly tracking, but following on. Sub-Saharan Africa's economy was shadowing, in some respects, China's economy because of this dependence on China and India to less but certainly China as a destination for exports. Now, of course, this is, goes back to precisely what I said, which was that the Africa rising period of high GDP growth was not domestically driven or internally driven. It was based on external demand, and of course, China in particular. So, during the Africa rising period, there was a lot of excitement about the BRICS, and there was a lot of excitement that China had become the number one trading partner with the continent as a whole, that India had emerged as, as number three, and that some of the colonial countries, the former colonial countries such as Britain, had dropped off the, off the map, as it were. And so now we get, the, what we saw was a diversification of Africa's international relations and Africa's trade, okay? Moving away from the typical colonial pattern of exporting back to France or Belgium or to the United Kingdom, right? Although France, of course, still remains quite important. But now we're seeing new actors, China, India, Brazil. Uh, we also saw some countries such as Singapore, United Arab Emirates, um, others becoming more interested in Africa. So we have seen a diversification of, of Africa's trade, trade patterns, which at one, one level you can say is positive, because they're not so reliant upon the Europeans anymore. But when you look at the structure of the trade, what we've seen is not a diversification of Production, what we've seen is simply a diversification, as, as the title of the book implies, of dependency. The dependency patterns of exporting commodities, importing manufactured products, has stayed, stayed constant, whether we're talking about China, uh, Africa's relationship with France or Britain, or Africa's relation with China <coughs> or India. It's still the same pattern of trade. And as it shows, if you look at trade between Brazil, India, and China, okay, Brazilian trade of Africa, 85% minerals and oil, okay, China, 65%. But then you add in other commodities, okay, you can see here that trade with the BRIC, between the BRICS and Africa, very much focused on primary commodities, very much focused on material which is then processed overseas, very much focused on stuff which just does not contribute to the diversification and industrialization of Africa, as, as the previous graphs, ACET 15, demonstrated. So this is a bit of a problem, right? Because on the one hand, you have this excitement about the BRICS, saying they're bringing something new to Africa, they're bringing these new ways of doing business, and they're, doing, they're bringing new development models, etc., etc. And then you have, a, at the same time, you have people saying, look, Africa's got this fantastic GDP growth, something must be changing, uh, something's improving. We're, maybe there's going to be some sort of partnership between the BRICS and Africa, which will then act as a catalyst for African development, and finally, the continent will be on a path of sustainable development and diversification, etc. But when you look at the evidence, it's, not, it's just simply not there. Okay? The structures of trade are very similar to what the Europeans have been doing for the last um, 200 years or so. Now, the dependency of, of Africa, the continent, sub-Saharan Africa, on, on the BRICS actually became quite a problem. So in 2015, the World Bank devised a model where they basically said, OK, what happens if the BRICS countries' economies start slowing down? What's going to be the impact upon the continent, Africa, the African continent? And as you can see here, Africa becomes so dependent on the BRICS economies that a slowdown of their economies would be more damaging to Africa than 
conflict, like, to war. That's how serious the dependency of Africa on the BRICS countries came during this period. And that tells you a lot uh, of potential problems. Now, as you all know, your neighbours have been uh, that's re trying to restructure their economy. And one of the things which this has led to is